Welcome to Inspiration and Transformation from the Banks of the Ganga with Sadvi Bhagwati Saraswati, an American sannyasi living at the Parmarth Nikitan Ashram in Rishikesh, India. Sadvi is president of the Divine Shakti Foundation, a charitable organization bringing education, vocational training, upliftment, and empowerment programs to women and children. Sadvi is also Secretary General of the Global Interfaith Wash Alliance and Director of the world famous International Yoga Festival. Join the musings of an American sannyasi as Sadvi shares the wisdom and teachings of her guru, His Holiness Pujya Swami Chidanand Saraswatiji. Welcome, everyone, to Inspiration and Transformation from the Holy Banks of the sacred Ganga River in the land of Rishikesh, India. She said at this age, I would say at, at any age, the relationships that are deep and are connected are far more valuable than the relationships that are just upper duper say. And as she was saying, you know, but how do we find those? Well, you find the connected relationships by being someone who is open. If we are meeting people upper duper say, and we are just giving our own drama and our own stories, we've all got our identity stories. If we run a went around here and we took the next few hours and I had everybody, you know, speak for one minute on who are you, you'd all have a story. You know, we call it the elevator version. It's the, the two minute, you've got two minutes in an elevator with someone, what's the story about your life you tell them? Who are you? If we're meeting someone at that level, then that's the level the relationship's going to be at. But if we meet people at a real level, for example, someone says to you, oh, nice to see you, Kaseyab. How are you? Now, what do most of us say? Bahadbariya. Now, that's great. It's wonderful to be positive. But surely there are times in our life that we don't actually feel Bahadbariya. Surely there are days in our life when it, something has happened or struggling with something. And if you actually can be honest, someone says, how are you? And I don't mean to the guy on the street, but I mean to someone who you feel like this could be a connected relationship. They say, how are you? And you say, well, you know, I've really been struggling with this thing. Or this happened, and you know, it's really caused me to be, to be a little bit less buriya than I usually am. And I'm looking for... I'm looking for a way of working with that. So it's not, it's not gossip. It's not, oh God, you will not believe what this guy did to me. It's not that. It's not complaining. But it's just actually being open and vulnerable. And then what you find is that in that, you create the space for other people to then be deeply connected. Our physical body connects to other people's physical body. Whether it's in a, you know, sexual relationship or whether you're playing tennis or you're shaking hands, whatever it may be, physical body connects with physical body. Intellectual mind connects with intellectual mind. You're having a discussion, you're having a debate, you're making plans. Soul connects to soul. And if your goal is to connect to someone at that level, or even if, if we're not yet ready to go all the way to the soul, to the heart, the deep heart, well, my heart is going to connect to your heart, which means that I have to be willing and courageous enough to actually show you my heart. Without shame, without telling little white lies to make things sound nicer, without worrying what you're going to think about me. I have to be prepared to show you my heart. 
of course, knowing that you might betray me. There's always a risk. There's always a risk. But it's a necessary risk. Getting into your car is always a risk. You could always have an accident. There's lots of people who die in car accidents. But we get in our car. And if we're smart, we wear a seatbelt, we drive the speed limit, we do our best to stay safe. But we know there's a risk. But we do it because we have to go somewhere. If otherwise you're relegated to only going someplace you can walk, which of course is still a risk, you could still get hit by a car even if you're walking. So what's the option? Stay home. Well, that's a risk. There could be an earthquake. Your ceiling could fall on you. There could be a fire. So life is a risk. But we have to decide how much are we prepared to be paralyzed because we don't take a risk. So start to meet people heart to heart. Not everyone. Not necessarily. I mean, eventually I would say everyone. But sl start slowly. Start with people you feel you can trust and see whether you can take the relationship deeper. And you don't need a million of those connections. A, f a handful of them. A couple. I mean, if you've got even two, three relationships in your life, even one, where you can really, really be open, that's a beautiful blessing. But you have to try. You have to take that step. And of course, we all have to have these sort of upward, upward relationships. And yet, what I would suggest is that some of them can be taken a step deeper. But we just have to be prepared to do it. There's a lot of dekanika in the culture, a lot of sort of showing ourselves. It's what leads us to tell lies that we don't even think of are lies, but that aren't true, so therefore they're lies. But if someone said, Abjut bolre, ni ni ujut to ni mani basisi tere se bola tha ki thoda sa ortik lagta hai. To agar sach ni to ujut hai, no options. But but we say it because to tell the truth makes us feel. We feel shameful, or we feel embarrassed, or we feel too vulnerable. And I'm not saying that you have to bear your soul and your entire family drama to the checkout clerk at the grocery store. There are times when just ekdam tika is a perfectly fine answer to how are you. But see how many of these relationships you can start taking deeper. A step at a time, just see what happens. What happens if you actually answer honestly? What happens if you meet someone from really a place of honesty? What happens inside you and what happens inside the relationship? I mean, the worst, worst case scenario is the person tells everyone, ah, oh, you know, she's really struggling. Tika, who isn't struggling? Fine, so people know you're human. Okay, they're also human. But chances are that's not going to happen. Typically people tend not to do that. But take that first step. And just start meeting the world. Meeting yourself, honestly. Because the truth is, if I'm telling everyone and myself, when I'm not... Not only am I missing the possibility of a deeper connection, but I'm also missing the opportunity to actually become Behold Bria. Because if I don't admit to myself that I'm struggling in some way, then I miss the opportunity to actually heal that and to grow and to really find that joy and peace. So if we, if we showed less, and actually lived more. We'd actually be a lot happier and our relationships would be would be a lot deeper. 
You're listening to OTRFM, part of the IOM Radio Network. Being a radio host on IOM FM allows you to build your show on a rich platform with the power of the internet to fulfill your outreach goals and connect with a very specialized and global online audience, unlimited by time and distance. Ohm Times Radio will provide you with web relevance, a recognizable conscious brand, and with the standard of excellence that has accompanied every single Circle of Hearts Radio is a sanctuary on the airwaves. Join me, Grandmother Aliyah, in the circle on Sunday, 2 p.m. Eastern, as I share information to both enlighten and nourish your soul. Hi, this is Christina Ricci with Rain. Every two minutes, another American is sexually assaulted. If you or someone you know has been sexually assaulted, you are not alone. Help is just a call or click away through the National Sexual Assault Hotline. Please call 1-800-656-HOPE, that's H-O-P-E, or visit RAIN.org, that's R-A-I-N-N dot O-R-G. Brought to you by RAIN and this station. Welcome back to Inspiration and Transformation. I'm so glad to have you all back here with me. Why is it so hard to choose things that are good and healthy? Why do we crave the exact opposite? So the nature of the mind, the nature of temptation, the nature of desires, a lot of it has to do with our conditioning. And so, for example, everybody loves sweets. Now, on the one hand, some of it is just seems universal and almost innate. Doesn't matter where you are, choti si beche, chocolate, and kids go crazy. Doesn't matter where they are, rich, poor, the east, the west, the north, the south. Piece of candy, piece of chocolate, is what kids want everywhere. But that's just, that's just something they like. They're not walking through the world thinking, God, when am I going to get a chocolate? When am I going to get a chocolate? I wish I could have a chocolate now. This was a bad day. I didn't have a chocolate. They just happen to like it. It becomes a problem and a craving when wherever we are, we're unable to be enjoying and loving that moment because we're wanting something else. And then you ask, well, why, why do we tend to crave things that are not good for us? It tends to come from our conditioning, both in our families when we were young, as well as from our culture. So for example, think about if you have children or grandchildren. When the kids do something really good, maybe they get an A on the exam, or they clean up their room, or they do all their chores, or they eat all their dinner. The things that we want them to do, they do it. How do we reward them? Sweets, right? Cookies, cake, ice cream. And so the sweets, which were naturally anyway something they liked, become a symbol of love. When we want to show a young child that we love them, we give them sweets, toffees, chocolate, cookies, ice cream, whatever it may be. So as we grow, as we grow, something very interesting happens, which is we identify sweets with love. And when we're craving love, what do people tend to do? Buy a chocolate cake and eat the whole thing. (laughs) 
eat a pint of ice cream, right? Not just a spoonful, not just a scoop, not just something to enjoy in the moment, but we end up eating way too much because what we're looking for is not actually just a sweet. We're looking for love. We've associated that dessert with love. So that's one of the reasons that the craving is there. We're not just craving sugar. We're craving love. And so if you find that happening, and you find yourself looking for love in cookies and ice cream, acknowledge what you're really looking for. Because obviously a pint of ice cream is not giving you what you really want anyway. At the end of it, you just have a stomach ache. You certainly don't feel any more love. Acknowledge what you're really craving, which is not the sugar. You're craving what the sugar symbolized. And then try to find that. How can you actually experience love instead of a stomach ache? Give love. Serve. Go read at a, in a nursery school. Spend time with kids. Spend time with others. Whatever your, your way of finding that may be. There's so many ways in the world to actually fill ourselves with love. The other reason that we tend to crave things that are not so good for us is it actually is what marketing and advertisement tends to sell us. There's not a lot of people or companies making a lot of money on carrots or spinach. I mean, there are. There are it's not that there aren't vegetable growers and people who make a living doing that. But they're not making nearly as much as Nestle is making or Cadbury is making or you know, the companies that make things that are not good for us or as cigarette companies are making. So the advertising by these massive companies, whether it's sugar sodas, whether it's chocolate and other dessert foods, whether it's cigarettes, whatever it may be, one of the reasons we crave them is that we've spent so many years of our life getting indoctrinated by billboards, by advertisements, commercials, showing it's an advertisement for cigarettes, let's say. Well, they don't show somebody in a hospital bed hooked up to a ventilator still needing a nicotine patch because they really want a cigarette, but they can't smoke because they're on a ventilator. That's not very romantic. It's probably not going to sell a lot of cigarettes. So instead, they show very, you know, beautiful people, young, looking great, smiling. And maybe they're at some beautiful party. Maybe they're sitting on the beach together as the sun goes down. But what they always are is very happy, very peaceful, very free, really enjoying the moment. They're beautiful. Now, what we learn is, ah, I'm not feeling so happy today. Maybe I should take up smoking. Now, it's ridiculous when you think about it like that. But actually, that is how we get indoctrinated. That's the whole science of marketing and advertising. Is by making people think that through the cigarettes through the ice cream, through the chocolate, that they are actually going to find happiness that they're looking for, right? Or it's a, it's a commercial of, you know, a very, very happy person, and she's walking down the street, she's skipping, she's dancing, of course she's gorgeous, wearing, you know, beautiful, expensive, fashionable clothing. 
and she's got, you know, a Snickers bar in her hands, and she's halfway through a bite into the Snickers bar as she kind of leaps into the sky. So if your day is feeling a little bit dry and boring, where does the mind go? Ah, I should have a Snickers. And instead, you end up eating the Snickers, sitting in the same boring and dry place. Now you're bored and you have a stomach ache. So it doesn't serve us, but this is, this is where desire comes from. And so dealing with craving, it's especially where craving comes from, is we've been so indoctrinated to believe that something we really want lies in something else. And so it's important to A, look at it, understand it. What is the core craving? Well, we're all craving joy. We're craving peace. We're craving meaning in our life. We're craving connection. We're craving love. This is, this is the core needs that we are looking for. Instead of thinking that cigarettes or Snickers bars are going to bring them to you, actually find. Work to find the divine connection to the divine, to yourself. Find meaning in your life. Whatever you're doing, it doesn't matter. It could be a, a mail clerk, a sweeper. It's irrelevant. Find meaning in your every minute and every moment. What you bring to that moment, what you bring to the people around you, what you bring to that situation what you bring to planet Earth. And find love. Again, it doesn't have to be romantic love. We know that so frequently with romantic love anyway, it ends up leading to so much frustration and heartache anyway. I'm not saying it can't be very beautiful. Of course it can be beautiful. But if you look at the sages and the rishis and the saints and the prophets and the enlightened beings of so many different religious traditions in the world. In many, many cases, they were monastics. Now I mention that not to say you should go the other way. Not to say you have to become celibate or a monastic to find it. But just to point out that wherever your path is to find love. There's, there's no path that's better than others. If your path is to walk a householder life, beautiful. Find that loving connection in the spouse, in the children, in the family. And if that's not your dharma, don't worry. Because there's a whole beautiful spiritual history of people in divine ecstasy in love with God, in love with creation, in love with everyone, in love with nature. And one of the most beautiful ways to find that love is in service, helping others, connect with them. Maybe you're working in a soup kitchen. Maybe you're making sandwiches for the hungry. Maybe you're distributing blankets to homeless people. Maybe you're, you know, reading in a, in a school or volunteering in a state-run children's hospital or whatever you may be doing. But if you're finding that you're really, really full of cravings and longing, find some way to fulfill that longing in a way that's actually meaningful rather than just a stomach ache from eating the wrong things or lung cancer from smoking to be cool. And then the last piece about that is 
there's a lot more pieces, but last piece for right now, is start practices that make you realize you are not your craving. A lot of times we crave something, we want something, and so we just do it. Like we think, have to do it. One of my favorite stories about this is told by beautiful, wonderful mentor, guide who was talking about a friend of his who had a sugar problem and especially a pastry problem. He loved pastries and had a major, major issue with pastries. And so every day on his way to work, he would get off the bus, buy a bag full of pastries, and then go to work. So he said to this other, this other man, this beautiful mentor and teacher, he said, you've got to help me. Like, I really want to go on a diet. I want to stop eating a whole bag of pastries every day. But I, I don't know what to do. Like, I don't even plan to go into the store. It just happens. One minute I'm getting off the bus. The next minute I'm sitting in my office with my mouth full of, you know, powdered sugar and whatnot. And so this this mentor and guide says to him, he says, well, have you tried leaving your wallet at home? Then you won't have any money to buy them. And the guy says to him, he says, what? He says, you want me to steal them? Now, I love that because the idea that I wouldn't buy the pastries is inconceivable. Either I have money and I'm going to pay for them, or if I leave my wallet at home, I'm going to have to steal them. But either way, I have to have them. Start to train yourself. Train yourself a little bit. If you're one of those people of, you know, you've got to have a dessert with every meal, well, start having one, you know, maybe three times a week. See, half the time, can you not have dessert? What happens? And even other cravings. Whatever the craving may be, see whether you can, even if it's not something that's bad for you, just to train the mind. Are you craving to check your Facebook? Don't. Not that you never can do it, but just don't this time. 50% of the time that the mind says, I'm going to pick up my phone and scroll Instagram, just don't. Just to see. What's it like? What's it like not to give in to an instinct? And slowly, slowly, as you, as you practice this, what you'll find is that the quality of your mind gets stronger and stronger. Because you realize, ah, there's a craving. But I don't have to give in to it. When you're walking down the street and you're walking by a store and you look in, you want to buy something. 50% of the time, don't. If you still really want it, when you walk by it the next time, it can be one of the 50% of the time that you do buy it. So I'm not saying you never can buy it. But just don't now. There's a beautiful, very, very, very famous study called the Marshmallow Study that they did with little kids where they took kids, I can't remember exactly how old they are, but they were toddlers, two, three years old. And they gave them a choice. There was a plate with a marshmallow on it. They put the kids alone in a room. It was a one-way glass, so they could watch the kid, but the kid didn't know that they were being watched. And they said, okay, you have a choice. You can have this marshmallow now. Or if you can wait, I forget how long it was. It wasn't very long. Maybe it was 10 minutes. It wasn't an hour. Maybe it was 10 minutes, maybe 15 minutes. Then you can have two marshmallows. And what they found was, decades later, the toddlers who could actually wait the 10 or 15 minutes for two marshmallows, who understood 
It is actually in my best interest to wait. Ended up being so significantly more successful in their careers and their lives, happy, peaceful, like on every marker. Those kids were so much better off. Now, of course, at that time, it's just a quality of the mind. But if at that young age, they already have that quality that says, oh, I can wait. I'm good. I don't need it. That it actually leads to a lifetime of success. So it's not too late, don't worry. If you were one of the toddlers who would have eaten the marshmallow right away, if you're still like that, don't worry. You can train yourself. Just 50% of the time that you want to do something, don't. See what happens. See how the brain and the mind change and understand, ah, I'm actually in control here. And then when your cravings arise, you've got a much stronger mental capacity to not give in to them. This is OTRFM, part of the IOM radio network. OM Times Magazine is one of the leading online content providers of positivity, wellness, and personal empowerment, a philanthropic organization. Their net proceeds are funneled to support worldwide charity initiatives via Humanity Healing International. Through their commitment to creating community and providing conscious content, they aspire to uplift humanity on a global scale. Om Times, co-creating a more conscious lifestyle. Do you have time to read that inspiring book or that blog post you've been meaning to get to? In your busy world, how do you improve yourself and keep your life going? I'm Lisa Kay, and my Between Heaven and Earth radio show can transform your life just by listening. Be uplifted with inspiring topics, positive stories, and ideas that really work. Between Heaven and Earth Radio is conscious living for your soul. Every Wednesday at 4 p.m. Eastern Time. Like Baldwin with people for the ethical treatment of animals. I grew up loving circuses and other traveling animal shows, but it never occurred to me what life might be like for the animals. Training wild animals to do things they don't understand takes force. Routine discipline with a hook or whip with the heel of a boot shows the animal exactly who's the boss. Don't patronize animal acts. Please contact people for the ethical treatment of animals. 757-622-PETA Welcome back. This is Sadvi Bhagavati Saraswati with inspiration and transformation. How do we know the right dharma? So you're right, it does change. And this is actually a mistake that people make. A lot of people think that they've got one dharma, and that's pretty much all they're supposed to do. And everything else pales in comparison. It's a total waste of their time. Even at any given moment, we have a lot of dharmas, right? Again, personal story. So clearly I've got a dharma of being here and doing this. I also have the dharma as a daughter. I was in America for seven months this year, the longest I've been there in 25 years because my mom had a very bad stroke and I had to go take care of her. And then I brought her here because it was my dharma to take care of her. But imagine, imagine if after the first two weeks I said, you know what, I got to get back to India because that's my dharma. Now, from the age of 17, when I graduated high school and moved off to go to college, I knew, I knew that I was not meant to live at home, that I wasn't meant to be in LA, that I really was on a totally different path. I didn't know what it was at that time, but I knew it was different. And yet this year, the path brought me right back to LA, into my parents' home. 
And it was so interesting because it gave me such a beautiful opportunity. I mean, could you even imagine if I said, you know what, this really is not my dharma to deal with this. But not only, not only was I given the beautiful opportunity to fulfill a dharma, but I was given the beautiful opportunity for a, a spiritual experience that I never would have had otherwise in so many different ways. And so we all have, even at any given moment in time, a lot of different dharmas. Those of you who are parents, you've got your dharma as a child, you've got your dharma as a mother or a father. If you're married, you've got your dharma as a spouse. So even before you start to even think about my higher purpose, you've got all of your different family dharma. Then you've got your actual incarnation dharma, which is wake up. And that is true regardless of who you are. Wake up. Realize who you are. Realize that you're not the body. You have a body. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. We are not supposed to neglect it or deny it. But we're also not supposed to confuse ourselves and think we are it. To be as conscious as we can in every given moment. To be those transmitters of love and peace. Truth. To be tools in God's hands as well as Channels of the divine flow here on earth. Every one of us. One of my favorite teachings from the Bhagavad Gita is two different parts. Right? And not only the Gita, you could even expand it into all of the scriptures. Two different parts. So part one is all of the different times and all of the different scriptures we are told that God lives in all of us, right? That every one of us is divine. We're given it in so many different mantras, so many different prayers, so many different teachings, so many different shastras. But the teaching is the same. The divine is in all of us. That's teaching one. Teaching two. In the Bhagavad Gita, when Lord Krishna says, When darkness is overpowering light and a dharma is overpowering dharma, I incarnate in form to bring back light to the darkness, dharma to the adharma. Well, if you take both of those two teachings together, what does it mean? We are the ones. We are that incarnation. Meant to bring back light to the darkness. Bring back dharma to the adharma. Each of us in our own ways. But that's your, that's your highest dharma. It's all of our highest dharmas. If we get anything stamped onto our rear end as we come through the birth canal, it isn't our career It isn't our title. It's divine. The one. So all of our highest dharma is to realize that. Then we also have our kind of individual dharma. Aside from the relationship dharma that we all have aside from our highest dharma. Then you've got dharma based on your particular path. And there isn't an equation to know what's right. And as you said, it changes throughout our life. As a student, our dharma is to study. Unless, of course, we're walking home from school and we see the school bully picking on someone, at which point it is our dharma to stop them. If we're not big and strong enough to 
call a teacher or the principal or someone. So even in fulfilling our dharma of the moment, different dharmas arise every minute, every moment. In that fulfillment of the higher one, of truth and love, peace, divinity. So there isn't an equation to tell you at this exact intersection of time and space, what is your dharma du jour? But what I would say is, I believe very strongly in the intelligence of the universe. And everything in the universe knows what to do. Apple seeds know to become apple trees. You never get an orange tree from an apple seed. All the different animals know to eat their food, to sleep according to their schedule. They don't mix it up. I always say, you know, the dog could chase the bird to the roof. But when the bird flies off, the dog's not going to jump. It understands I don't have wings. If everything in nature knows what to do, that intelligence is in us as well. And we just have to be still and clear and humble enough to hear it. And to pull away from those ideas of it's going to be glamorous, it's going to be fun, it's going to bring me a lot of appreciation, it's going to be romantic, it's going to be extraordinary. But allow that humbleness in which if your dharma is to be the guy chopping the stones, starting a revolution of girls' education that you won't even know in this lifetime, then so be it. And that's not less. There's no higher or lower one. But I deeply believe, and I've seen in my own life, that if we are humble and open and willing, we know. This is OTRFM, part of the IOM Radio Network. Om Times Magazine is one of the leading online content providers of positivity, wellness, and personal empowerment, a philanthropic organization. Their net proceeds are funneled to support worldwide charity initiatives via Humanity Healing International. Through their commitment to creating community and providing conscious content, they aspire to uplift humanity on a global scale. Om Times, co-creating a more conscious lifestyle. Do you have time to read that inspiring book or that blog post you've been meaning to get to? In your busy world, how do you improve yourself and keep your life going? I'm Lisa Kay, and my Between Heaven and Earth radio show can transform your life just by listening. Be uplifted with inspiring topics, positive stories, and ideas that really work. Between Heaven and Earth radio is conscious living for your soul every Wednesday at 4 p.m. Eastern Time. Like Baldwin with people for the ethical treatment of animals. I grew up loving circuses and other traveling animal shows, but it never occurred to me what life might be like for the animals. Training wild animals to do things they don't understand takes force. Routine discipline with a hook or whip with the heel of a boot shows the animal exactly who's the boss. Don't patronize animal acts. Please contact people for the ethical treatment of animals. 757-622-PETA Welcome back. This is Sadvi Bhagavati Saraswati with inspiration and transformation. He's asked, how do we get rid of our past life karma? And is it true that if you die at the right time or if you... Say Lord Krishna's name as you are, as you are dying, that you will attain moksha. First of all, you can only remember Krishna's name when you're dying if you've chanted it through your life. It is an illusion, an absolute illusion that somehow at the last moment, as you are leaving your body, you're going to do something that you haven't done 
throughout your life. But people think that. Tell me, kuchbi karlu. Last minute, may. Naraya, 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 naraya. tabi hoga last me. Jab roch. Naraya, 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 naraya. Jab yehi hota roch. Tob last minute me hoga. And yes, chanting God's name is certainly a way to purify us, to purify our minds. I mean, if you've got a choice of thinking lustfully or thinking in greed or thinking in anger, plotting revenge or chanting God's name, obviously you are much better off chanting God's name. The mind is going to be purified by that. It's going to help purify us of the vasanas, of all of the illusions, of all of the distractions. Because for most of us, our downfall is not that we're evil. It's that we're distracted. We allow our minds to distract us. An idea comes, a thought comes. Like me, what I was speaking about with the Dharma and my friend who I got the black belt with. If that gets in my mind... And then I start thinking, God, yeah, really? She's in much better shape at 55 than I am at 50. I really should have done that. God, tell her it's not too late, maybe. Tell her I'm going phone, Carlo. I'm going to go to the I'll get back into fighting. I could end up ruining my life. Just because of one thought that I allowed to distract me in such a way. This is ego. This is ignorance. But this is the game of maya. This is the game of the mind. That plays with us. Tell her this one's making this much a month. Went into business. I was trying to start my own company to do something good for the world. Some kind of special green technology. But tell her, Choro, I'll just go into business like this guy. You lose the opportunity. So most of us, we're not, we're not evil, we're not wrong. We're just distracted by our own minds that actually keep us from clearly walking our path. And this is why Jap is so important, why taking the name of God or whatever you chant in your mantra is so important. Because it purifies us. It keeps us from getting distracted. Keeps us from getting lost. And in terms of freedom from the karma of past lives, that which we did in a past life or that which we did earlier in this life is going to manifest. You plant an apple seed. You're going to get an apple tree. I always say, it doesn't do you any good to stand over that apple seed chanting orange mantras or saying orange prayers or, you know, trying to wave an orange magic wand over it that kisi tada say, ye apple bead se merikwek orange tree milega. Hogani. There are laws of the universe. Karma is one of them. Now, there are things we can do to mitigate it. Meaning to make it slightly easier to digest. The grace of the Guru is the main, most powerful one. For example, let's say there's an accident in your future. With grace, maybe instead of being a fatal car accident, you'll stub your toe or you'll twist your ankle. Or maybe you'll have that accident in your dream. Sometimes people think that what they see in their dream is a premonition. But actually, in many cases, it's the grace and the compassion of the universe saying, Cello, let's give it to you in the dream rather than in life. So things can be done to mitigate that, some of it. Not all of it. Some of it we have to just go through. 
And that's where our sadhana is so important because it helps us be able to take whatever that fruit may be. It doesn't turn the apple tree into an orange tree, but it teaches us how to be able to eat apples, how to enjoy apples. But also along with that, remember that right now is the past life of your next birth. Jo aap aaj kar rahe aapka port of janam ka karm hai agli janam ke liye. Aaj ka karm is your next life's port of janam karm. So what you are doing right now is laying the ground for not only your next life, but it's laying the ground for tomorrow, for next week, for next month. This moment is the moment that predetermines next week, next month, next year. We talk about, are, is everything predetermined, predestined? Well, some of it comes from past lives, but a lot of it comes from this life. Today is the pre, in the predestined of tomorrow. If today you walk off of the top of a building, you are creating the fact that tomorrow, you are predestining it, that tomorrow you will be dead or injured very badly. Now you could say tomorrow, oh, was it predestined? Well, it was predestined when he walked off the roof. So don't worry so much about past lives. There's no rewind function on life. I spend a lot of time at a computer during the day. And I find myself sometimes in life thinking that, you know, I'll spill a glass of water, let's say. And I'll think my mind will go, oh, I'll just control Z that. Right? So on a computer, when you hit control Z, it just undoes whatever the last action was. Whatever it was, it's undone. And my mind will sometimes say, oh, I'll just, I'll just control Z that. And it takes a moment to realize, oh, actually, that was a real glass of water. I can't unspill it. There's no key I can press that's going to unspill my water or put words back in my mouth that I've spoken or undo actions I've done. Instead, what I need to do is make this moment a moment that's conscious, a moment that's surrendered, a moment in which I'm chanting God's name, and then let the next moments take care of themselves. They will. This brings to a close this hour of inspiration and transformation. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm so glad to be together with you all each week. And I look forward to being together again next Thursday, same time, on Ohm Times Radio. Mm -hmm.